<laughs> Welcome to Meep Troid. Okay. Alright, we should be live. Okay. Welcome to Adventures in Platforming, where we are going to take a look at Metroid Prime 2, which I had said we were going to do a while ago to celebrate the release of the remake of Metroid 2. But due to computer failure, Destiny 2's release, and random other stuff, uh, it took kind I of appreciate a you like pretending Destiny 2's release was something that could, just couldn't be avoided. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the uh, I guess somewhat maligned sequel to Metroid Prime, which is still regarded as one of the best games of all time. For this, sure. this is still well liked. I just I feel like it's just generally not as well liked as its predecessor. Yeah, and kind of hard to follow up on it too, especially relatively quickly after the original. Yeah, it was about it was about two years. But yeah, Metroid Metroid Prime was a surprise hit because people expected to hate it because they assumed it would be Quake. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It was not Quake at all. It I was Metroid. And I think Nintendo expected uh, Metroid Fusion to be the more popular of, of the two releases. I don't know that they expected it to be the more popular one, although it probably sold better because it was a Game Boy Advance game and not a GameCube game. Yeah, that's but, true. But it was one of those things, like, they, they evidently... Like... They wanted to make sure that Prime would be done right, which is why they killed basically every other project that Retro was working on at the time. Yeah. Like, when they when they first got... Uh, when they first contracted with Retro, like, Retro had, like, five different games in development. They had, like, an action RPG that was, I think, the only one that was ever shown. They had a football game. They had... Like, they were basically trying to tackle every kind of, like, major Western... Like, uh, Western sorts of games that Nintendo didn't really have in its portfolio. And then when they got the Metroid Prime contract, Nintendo was like, no, you're going to do this right. All these other things are cancelled. <laughs> but, yeah, this is, uh, this is also the beginning of producer Kensuke Tanabe's long history with the series. Uh, he was the co-producer on this one, uh, on the first one, and has been the producer of every Metroid Prime game since. Mm. And that includes Pinball. So this one kind of takes a zelda E spin for the series, because we got the two different worlds. Let's talk about Link to the Past. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just going to say, I, my intention was that I was going to pull my save from the GameCube and then use that when we did this recorded so we we could see more of the game, but I wasn't able to get that ready in time, so we may do a second episode of this further yeah. in. As we've threatened to do many times and never yeah. actually done. <laughs> uh, we did for... Um, uh, I know we've done a, a second episode. We we did a second episode for ukulele. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we'll probably do a third f to celebrate its eventual Switch release. So yeah, if you've never played e any of the Prime games, uh, they are certainly not like super action-y first-person shooters, as you can see. There's certainly some difficult first-person shooting sections, but that is much much in the same way that there are some difficult action sequences in any given 2D Metroid. Right. But, uh, yeah, this is a say very like it was. This was Nintendo's big two, late '04 game. Like, every every company had one, and the GameCube was already kind of on the way out by that point, and to be honest, so was the Xbox, but the Xbox still had Halo 2. Yeah, uh, which is somewhat big. Yeah, a little bit, little bit yeah. of a world beater, that one. But this is uh, now 13 years old. Damn. Which I believe means that me and Wales are both crumbling into death. <laughs> Well, and graphically, it has aged incredibly well. Actually, it's got a it's got a very good, consistent art direction, as the Prime games always did. Yeah. If you compare this to, like, say, I don't know, um, Halo Two. Wow, uh, rude! <laughs> Shots could, fired. I think it fares pretty well. But how do you feel about Halo Two Anniversary? Um, I haven't really played much of it, but that whole collection. I've had a lot of fun with. 
the Mr. Chief collection. Yeah, see, the thing about Halo 2 is that most people love the multiplayer in it, and the multiplayer played in Halo 2 Anniversary has been great, so that's all I, all I can say. I do appreciate the fact that uh, in that oral history of Halo that happened, like, I think it was on Waypoint, but I can't say for certain. But in that oral history, they were basically like, the, the person designing the multiplayer was like, yeah, they had like this big idea for like a different kind of multiplayer mode that like they like halfway through development realized wasn't working at all and had to cut. But like for most of the development, it was just me working on like making the traditional multiplayer mode and everyone was like, ha ha. You got dumped off onto the the multiplayer mode we don't care about, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's that was the mode, the only part that everyone agreed worked out. <laughs> that's a fascinating oral history. If you uh, yeah, I, I highly recommend reading that. It's just, yeah, little... the development of the single player was just an absolute mess. You find out that it's like the development was an absolute mess is kind of a running theme. Yeah. <laughs> the only one where it's not the case is like ODST. And that is continued on to their post-Microsoft days. Yeah. Although, as far as I can tell, the development of Destiny 2 is pretty smooth. Yeah, Destiny 2 seems to have gone a lot better than Destiny 1, which is actually covered in that because they were working on it before they left Microsoft. Probably because a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in it is cut content from the first game. Yeah, probably. <laughs> like, uh, well, one of the areas is, like, the European Dead Zone, which, well, I don't know if they actually worked, had started work on and any of it in Destiny 1, but I know that that was originally targeted for Destiny 1. I wonder so, if they fixed those development tools that people said, like, were horrendous in Destiny 1. <laughs> I think they must have. Just I would hope so, because, in like... In my opinion, just based on the raid in the game, because it is just like this... So it's like a massive ship... Yeah, and there's like just a huge network of tunnels that you can use to get around it, and like skip certain certain things. So uh, I'd imagine if they hadn't fixed the tools, that thing would have been an absolute nightmare to create, and probably uh, wouldn't have happened. Because the pet, the like the raids in the past were are super linear. Like you go from challenge, to challenge A, to the next challenge or boss. And that's pretty much it. It's not just like it's not like a giant, massive area or anything like that. Yeah, so. it was one of those things that like I remember reading about Destiny One's development tools. Is like we made some changes to the level, and now we're going to be spending like the entire day while it <laughs> while it basically dies. Yeah. So. Yeah. So Metroid Prime, kind of a kind of a big deal in both the series history. Like it's the closest the series has ever come to mainstream success. Yeah. And it did a great, like, great job of moving the series into 3D and really not losing much of the essence of it. Yeah, I feel like there's no Nintendo series, no major Nintendo series that went into 3D and just failed. Yeah. <laughs> like, there have been bad 3D entries of series they own, but there's never been one where it's like, they imme they botched the first attempt and no one ever believed it could happen again. <laughs> they ever do a 3D Kirby? There's never even been an attempt at a proper 3D Kirby. Okay. There, there, we've seen bits of prototypes, but, like, as far as I can tell, they've never really, like, gone forward with the idea of, like, we're just going to do a 3D Kirby. Yeah. So, as I'm sure you can see here, I have all my abilities, including Double Jump, and Morph Ball, I'm sure bombs. those are going to stay. Yeah. We're just going to add I mean, on to those. how could Samus lose abilities? Yeah, it doesn't happen. But uh, so one of the weird changes to this game is you eventually going with the whole dark world, light world theme. Is you eventually get two uh, different weapons, which obviously light weapon works against the dark dark world enemies, dark one works against the light world enemies. Uh, but the, the whole uh, one of the changes uh, I'm sure a lot of people didn't like was that they moved to an ammo system. Which, uh, I guess can be somewhat annoying, but I think it adds something to the game. So you have to consider yeah, that like they were, they were just trying to like make sure that they weren't just retreading the first game entirely. Yeah. Yeah, like, I feel like Metroid Prime 3 is probably the best-selling Metroid, if I were to just hazard a guess. 
like based on the size of the Wii's audience and the general like the Metroid Prime games are the best selling Metroids as I recall. It's just one of those things where like part of, part of the issue that Metroid continually runs into is that it's beloved by Nintendo fans, but that has never translated to how well it sells. Mm. Like, even the best-selling ones are like, oh, you did about as well as a bad-selling Zelda. Well, it's like the whole thing with F-Zero. It's like they made this game mostly to be a tech demo, and people seem to love it, but Nintendo could not give two shits about F-Zero. I'm not sure that they, I'm not sure that they can't, they don't care, but, like, at the same time, it's one of those situations where, like, they don't know where to take it. They're not sure what... And especially, like, because a lot of the time when you get these series that are defined by a very narrow sort of game design, it's like, how can we change this meaningfully without chasing away the people that like it? Yeah. I mean, you had the F-Zero for GameCube that was developed by Sega, right? Yeah, they farmed that out to Sega, and part of the reason they haven't done another one is that, like, Miyamoto is like, we don't know how to meaningfully add to it. Like, that was pretty. It ran at 60 frames per second. It was probably too hard. But like it was, what do we do with it now? And they've tried to they've tried to partner with third parties to like come up with fresh blood for it because like when the Wii U was first being put out, they approached Criterion about it, and Criterion was busy with like a Need for Speed game. So think about how tragic that is. Mm. But yeah, like they they wanted to like it's one of those things where like they want another company to take a crack at it because they don't know what to do with it. But, like, that's also why you never get another game that's just, here's Star Fox, but again, it's like, what do we do with that? <laughs> like, we would be remaking Star Fox 64 in all but name, which is why we will occasionally remake Star Fox 64 in name. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I wouldn't say Metroid's design is that rigid, but you can kind of see that they have issues with deciding what to do with it. Like, they they bring in someone else to do stuff on it, and, you know, you get other M sometimes. Yeah, let's not talk about that one. Yeah. In any case, uh, so it's it's a tough thing, and it's also, like, to do Metroid right is kind of resource-intensive, and Metroid games don't sell that great. Nope. But this was this was the heyday of when they sold Consummate to their budget, and were kind of big tentpole releases. This was a... This was this was their game for fall of two thousand four, which, as mentioned, very packed time. Mm. Metal Gear Solid three contemporary, uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas contemporary, and of course Halo two contemporary. What did you play the most of th- from that fall? Halo two. Wow, like an obscene amount of Halo two. Oh, that's a concerning statement. Oh, well, mostly the multiplayer, obviously. Of course. But, um, yeah, I I did not I could not afford this, and thus I I have never actually played it. Huh. <laughs> well, you can now get it on your Wii U as part of the Metroid Collection. Yeah, but that would require me to boot that thing up, and my TV is bust. But what about your gamepad? You can play it on the gamepad. Yeah, that would. Can you play it with buttons on the gamepad, though? No, it's Wii Remote only. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of not happening. <laughs> because, like, as much as like, I it liked the gamepad, and uh, but that would require me to position the gamepad far enough away to use its built-in sensor bar, mm. and also use it as the only means of display. <laughs> so, pro- probably not. That would yeah. be a little inconvenient. Well, you can play it on the Dolphin emulator on your PC or Mac. Yes, but no, I'm or I'm very busy. I'm very busy using that to play things that are terrible. It's like what? Oh, Darkened Sky. Ugh. The Skittles game. You love Ugh. it. Those are the same game. I didn't actually list two different games. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Def Jam Fight for New York. That's a good game. So yeah, speaking of Metroid 2s, the remake of Metroid 2 is fantastic. Yeah. Highly recommend it. 
probably the best thing that Mercury Steam's ever made. The, uh, I don't think you need to put the probably qualifier in there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I just I was I was just trying to you know in case you had differing opinions. No, no, I love the the last two thirds of uh, which we call it. Lord of Shadows. Lord of Shadows, <laughs> yes, but that first third is crap, so can't really rate that above Metroid 2 Remake. Yeah, which is good all the way through. And the sequel to that game has problems, so there you go. <laughs> Let's to not talk about it. Yeah. That 3DS one's real bad news. Eh, it's fine. It's just not it's great. Not, no, it's real bad, man. No, it's fine. Mirror Fate is, is like, dreadful. You're dreadful. Well, I mean, yes, but non-related. <laughs> I've always been weird at, like, how, how short Samus looks in in Metroid Prime to me. Like, the, the scale of the world always makes her seem shorter than she ought to be. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's that's just a personal thing, but, yeah. It's a minor nitpick, but it's just kind of weird. Uh, yeah, Wheels, tell me about the Super Nintendo Classic featuring Super Metroid just came out. It's pretty sweet. It's nice feeling like a brand new Super Nintendo controller. Yeah. You think they go for an N64 Classic after this, or do you think they uh, make... Uh, NES or SNES classics with different games in them? Uh, I think NES or SNES classic with different games in them. But you know, you never know, because like the N64 classic could be like this perfect gaming machine. Or uh, what I meant to say was party machine, rather. So yeah, but that also involves draw. licensing James Bond. Yeah, it does. So that's probably why it's not going to happen anytime like, soon. Have you ever heard the reason for why they didn't... Like, Rare was offered the, the next James Bond game after GoldenEye, because GoldenEye was a big hit. And they did, you, didn't. Uh, did you hear why they didn't bother? No. Uh, because they basically made... They made almost no money off of GoldenEye because of just the amount of, like, royalties that go to, like... Even just the James Bond theme is, like, oh, shave, like, a dollar or two. Oh, jeez. Because, like, the com person that composed that gets his own royalties separate from the film license. And then you get the, the cost of the actual cartridge production, which was very expensive. Like, which is why N64 games were so obscenely expensive. So oh, hey, it's Spooky Samus. Yes, so Spooky Samus, I believe, shows up at the end of Metroid Prime 1. And, I like, a hidden ending if you get yeah, 100%. I forget exactly what the deal is. Like... She's like a combination of like the met of the Metroid Prime, yeah. Samus's DNA and the Phazon suit from the end of Metroid Prime. That's right. She loses at the end of the game. Loses. Yeah. Oh yeah. So here's uh, here's a thing that makes this game way way harder than its uh, predecessor. If you're in the dark world, you're taking damage unless you're in like a light bubble. Mm-hmm. And, like, you get a suit that makes you take less damage, but you never don't take damage, from what yeah. I've heard. So, it makes... Ex the exploring the dark world is pretty stressful. Yeah. Which is neat, but also, like... Oh, God. Yeah. I'm dying. Uh, and you see, space jump thrusters offline. Grapple beam launcher offline. Morph ball yeah. boost unit offline, power bomb generator offline, missile launcher offline. You at least get to keep the morph ball, I guess? All remaining systems online and active. Thanks, computer. You, you get to keep your various suits. So you keep more than Metroid Prime 1 had. I feel like the, the Metro, in Metroid Prime 1, you lose... Basically everything. I think you might even lose the morph ball. It's not clear what took them, but, I mean, sure, they have to come up with an excuse every time. Yeah. At least it's not like Mega Man X, where he just, like, threw all of his weapons away. 
The special capsule that Dr. Light made me so that I would be, you know, able to break blocks with my head, I threw it in the trash. <laughs> Speaking of games on the Super NES Classic... <laughs> A game that system has a lot of platformers and RPGs, our two favorite things, so I mean, I'm going to keep bringing it up. And the SNES Classic, yes. Uh, yeah. And it has one that's both, Super Mario yeah. RPG. There's platforming in it. There's mostly RPG, but there's platforming in it. Uh, how do you feel about Gino? It's pretty cool. Not my favorite character in the game or anything. He's, he's the puppet man. I always thought the cloud guy was more amusing. Mallow? Yeah. Also yeah. Bowser, as always. Yeah. They would lean into him too hard in some of the later games, but he's pretty much pitch perfect for yeah. a Super Mario RPG. So let's go great soundtrack. Oh yeah, Yokoshimamura. Would go on to be the composer behind such wonderful projects as FF15 and the Kingdom Hearts series. She is also the uh, composer of a lot of the best music from Street Fighter 2. Nice. I mean, that SNES Classic also has Super Metroid. And yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a classic game. It's, it's the reason that Metroid has a hardcore fan base rather than people that played an NES game and a Game Boy game and wondered mm -hmm. what the hell was that. Because, <laughs> woo boy, what the hell was that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some games on there that probably haven't aged as well, but Super Metroid has aged wonderfully. Unlike, aged unlike like the... the fine wine. Unlike the NES classic, I wouldn't say there's any game that's aged so badly it no longer merited yeah. inclusion. <laughs> I mean, I, like I had a, a uh, an NES Classic briefly, but, you know, it was kind of disappointing to play, to be honest. It's one of those things where, like, a lot of those... There's very few games that aren't, aren't important, but a lot of them have aged poorly enough that they are no longer... They no longer merit replaying. Yeah. Like, go try and play the um, original version of uh, Final Fantasy. I, I was going Good to say, like... Ghosts and Goblins NES port does not belong on anything. No. Like, so that that was a port from very early in Capcom's life when they did not make console games themselves. It was made by a quote-unquote company called Micronics. I say quote-unquote company because Micronics might have just been one dude. <laughs> like, it's not super clear who what who was employed at Micronics, but it's there is a reason to believe that Micronics was a guy. And with that context, it's like, oh, I can kind of see why this janky port happened, but, like, it's not a good version, and it didn't belong there. <laughs> also, Cardinal Sin, Castlevania 1 and 2, but not 3. Yeah, that, what is up with that? Gross. That's okay, because you got gross. 4 on your SNES Classic. Yeah, which is not on the Japanese SNES Classic, by the way. Oh, that's weird. So, in exchange for getting Super Castlevania for Earthbound, Kirby's Dream Course, Street Fighter 2, Turbo, Hyper Fighting, and Super Punch-Out, we did not get, which, uh, the stuff that's on the Japanese ones is Fire Emblem, Mystery of the Emblem. I believe that's a remake of Fire Emblem 1? That sounds correct to me. Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, the first Super Famicom Mystical Ninja game, which did actually get localized, but, like, no one in America has ever cared other than me. I cared uh, about it. Well, I'm glad that someone else cared. My brother and uh, I used to play that game a lot. It's good time. Out the Pawn, aka Tetris Attack, working out the licensing on that would have been hell. Uh, Super Soccer? That's probably the most questionable thing on either version. I'm oh, sorry, Mega Man Soccer? What? Super Soccer. <laughs> Mega Man Soccer? Yes. And instead of uh, the the most curious change I feel like is that in America we get Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting in Japan they got Super Street Fighter 2 The New Challengers which is the last Street Fighter 2 variant that was ported to the SNES generally not as well regarded in America as Street Fighter 2 Turbo so they made the right choice uh, 
Like neither neither is definitive because the definitive one is super turbo. But I mean, of the two choices they had, I feel like uh, Street Fighter Two Turbo was the better choice. Mm. But uh, yeah, like it's it's in it's a pretty all star lineup. Contra Three DKC. Final Fantasy six slash three. Oh yeah, what's your favorite sub game in Kirby Superstar? Um they're, they're all good. They're all good. Every video game is good actually. Yeah, this uh, you know, I haven't played it in a while or ever. Um but yeah, they're all good. <laughs> well one of them's a remake of Kirby's Dreamland, one of them's a fake Metroid game. Uh by all accounts, they're all like people love them. It's, I'm very excited to finally get to play Kirby Superstar. So, mm. which in Europe got a pretty a pretty bad name. I'm, I'm very sad that they that they just like gave up on calling it anything with uh, with a coherent title in Japan. And just called it Kirby Fun Pack. That's terrible. Fun video game product. But yeah, like. Uh, you, you mentioned that some things on there might not have aged as well. Like, do you have a particular thought process on that? Like a particular one that you mm. think might not be a conclusion? I mean, Contra 3 is still great, but it's great. not I necessarily looks-wise. Oh, I would say it looks fine. Uh, what else is on there? Is Pilot Wings on there? Pilot Wings is not on there, and okay, that's okay. fine because it hasn't aged well. Yeah, um, the original Mario Kart, I think, is but. Yeah, I don't think Sorry. Super Mario Kart's very good. Yeah. It's it had to be on there because Mario Kart is huge. Like a complete juggernaut, but uh Super Mario World is terrible. That uh, Get what? I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. I, I was afraid I was going to have to fight you. No. Like in real life, I would have gone to where you live and actually gotten into a fist fight with you. Uh Star Fox and Star Fox two. Uh interesting. They look like butt. They look like they, butt, but they still play pretty well. So. Yeah, they look super butt, though. Well, one, I'm just really glad that we finally have an official release of Star yeah, Fox 2. Yeah, that is nice. A straight-up lost game. But beyond that, there's also just, like... It's also nice just because, the like, almost everything in the NES Classic was a thing you could get elsewhere. Yeah. Like, there was a way to procure a re-release of basically any game on that. You couldn't get Star Fox 1, 2, or Yoshi's Island in their original unadulterated forms legally yeah. outside of tracking down the original cartridges. Stuff's important to me. Also, you're being eaten by spiders. Nah, it's fine. They're fine. We're buddies. I guess. But also, I think they're ing. And wait, now the dark ones they're are They're basically ing? spiders. I forget what the heck they're called. So, as you can see, if it wasn't clear enough already, there's lots of puzzle solving and whatnot. And if anyone tells you it's just a first person shooter, they have never actually played the game. Same. Yeah, it's a, it's a like it, it's interesting the the kind of like quickly forged relationship that Nintendo and Retro Studios had. Yeah, it's like I don't think Retro Studios had released anything before uh, Metroid Prime. Uh, see, so yeah, they were founded in 1998 and released nothing. They were they were former uh, members of Iguana, which was a uh, it was I believe the developers of the Turok games on the N sixty four, which explains why they would have an in with Nintendo. 
because Turok was a very big N64 game, actually. That would actually be another thing that would be terrible, mm -hmm. but would merit inclusion on a supposed N64 classic by virtue of being historically important, but also be a licensing nightmare because it's based off a comic that I believe is now owned by Disney, of all companies. <sighs> That's weird. But, yeah, they, uh, they specifically helped bankroll uh, Retro on the promise of... Uh, that they would have more adult-oriented games for the GameCube. They offered them the Metroid license some time after staffing up. Uh, but they had like they had an action adventure game that never even got a name, a vehicle combat game that never got a wor anything beyond like a working title, like Car Combat or Thunder Rally was apparently how it was referred to. It's an NFL football game and a role-playing game called Raven Blade that I believe was shown at E3. Hmm. And I know I'm repeating myself, but it feels worthwhile to bring this stuff up because it's fascinating to me. Uh, they staff up around that time to about 100 employees. And... Uh, like basically, Nintendo gives them the Metroid license, tells them to maybe take a hike on all those other games because they need to focus on Metroid. And they bought a controlling stake in them in May of 2002, right around the time that they said they passed up trying to buy out Rare, which would have required them to match Microsoft's offer of $325 million. Which would have been stupid. It would have been an insane amount of money. Just a crazy amount of cash for them to lay out for that. And, because, uh, like, that was that was what their in, their stake in Rare amounted to, was that they could, they had the option to uh, match any purchase offer. Hmm. And Microsoft went, n went for a crazy number and gave them $325 million. So, uh, I don't know if Nintendo realized that uh, they weren't the same developer they had been, or saw the writing on the wall, or if they just lucked out. But it worked out pretty well for them. Yeah, they went on to spend 0.325% of that on buying Retro. Uh, I think it was probably well known that like their relationship was going to have to fracture in some fashion... By virtue of the fact that, like, if you listen to any sort of postmortem from Rare itself, or former members of Rare, it's basically like, we were chafing because Nintendo would, like, come in and, like, they would look at a project and say, this isn't turning out, you need to redo this, this, and this. Like, we thought they didn't, they weren't, uh, they weren't, like, respecting our creative vision, they weren't giving us enough control, they were, like, uh, they generally wanted us to stick to a relatively family-friendly, like, Set up like style, except for the occasional aberration like Contra, uh, like Conquer or Perfect Dark. Like our corporate visions were going one way, Nintendo's was going another. So like they were chafing, they were looking for a way to be able to do other things. But the other part of those postmortems is always, and then we went to Microsoft, and one Microsoft wanted us to keep making family friendly games because they wanted Nintendo's market, <laughs> and two, they didn't tell us to do things. We like, and it's telling that they get bought in fairly early in this Xbox's life cycle and succeed in producing a game. <laughs> one game. One awful, awful game. The only rareware game that successfully came out on the original Xbox is Grab by the Ghoulies. Which is an awful, awful, awful beat em up. It was, uh,. Yeah, it was one of those things, like, you know. It, and then, like, of course, the, the Stampers, like, stamp... The, the two people that founded Rare, the Stamper Brothers, step out fairly early on. I'm not sure how much longer they would have stayed on if the buyout had not gone through, but, like, it was one of those things I'm curious if they were just... I'm kind of done with this, this part of my life. I'm done. I've made a ton of money, and I don't need to be a game developer anymore. It's hard. <laughs> Which I wouldn't blame them for, but... Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, as it was put by those former employees, it was like, we got everything we thought we wanted, and it just it wasn't a good work environment, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, so did Rare move, or did they stay in the UK? Yeah, they're, they're still in the UK, okay. absolutely. But uh, So it wasn't like uh, with Bungie, where they had to get... In or they at least attempted to integrate them within the main Microsoft campus. 
Yeah, Microsoft was at least Microsoft was trying to give them a nice cushy place, but it was one of those things where it just didn't fit with the corporate culture. Yeah, they wanted no one basically wanted. as soon as they got there. Yeah, it was basically one of those things where they seem to have decided like the second that they did it that they regretted having done it. Yeah. But then again, like it was it was also at that point that like it starts to appear like maybe Jason Jones needs someone over his shoulder to tell him maybe don't do that. <laughs> maybe don't try to claim that you can just leave the Halo 2 team to go work on some smaller project that no one's ever seen or heard of. And watch as and not name another director and just sort of leave the team to descend into Lord of the Flies world. Uh, Halo Retrospective is uh, fascinating. Yes, it is. It also makes you feel even worse for how they dicked over the uh, composer. Yeah. There's got to be more of that story. What exactly that entails, who knows. Yeah. But still, it, it leads you to remember, ju more specifically, I mean, it just means, like, he was not just a composer, he did other things. Right. He was pretty integral to the company. Yeah. It is kind of hilarious seeing, like, the internal strife at Bungie, where, like, one of, one of their, like, heads is like, no, I got it, it'll be great, you'll get to the last part of Halo 2, and he'll be like, let's finish the fight, and it'll be the perfect cliffhanger, and every, and, like, half the team is like, what are you thinking? <laughs> Uh, it's the first time you had like a, a sort of like certainly in uh, outside of fusion the first time that there's like dialogue in the middle of a metroid game yeah but but certainly also like a flashback to what is essentially a small scale cutscene i admit i'm i'm very curious what Retro is working on now. Mm. I suspected we would see it at E3, but we did not. Unless it's Prime 4. If it was Prime 4, they would have said being developed by Retro Studios. You sure? They've, yes, because okay. they said it's a new studio working on it. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Yeah, I, I, I would like Retro to get the chance to make something new. Yeah. I enjoyed Donkey Kong Country Returns. I should pick up Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze before it disappears into the ether like most Wii U games will eventually. Yeah. Uh, but I've heard the, nothing good things. I think it's one of the, uh, what do they call it? Select Nintendo yes. Select. It is definitely a Nintendo Select. I've seen it many times and keep thinking I should play it. You should. But, uh... Yeah, I, I would like that to be upported to Switch, maybe, as well. <laughs> but I wouldn't want Retro to have to do it, because I feel like they, they deserve the chance to make something new. You certainly earned the chance. Yeah. Hey, uh... I mean, they certainly had ideas for new IP back in the day, so I wouldn't imagine those are gone. Uh, we shall see. But yeah, we've not. It's now been nearly four years since their last game. I think it was their last game was Tropical Freeze in like February of 2014. So let's see. When was Thank You Kane? Yeah, February of 2014. And yeah, we know that they have some sort of un unannounced project, because I mean, obviously. And the claim is that it's been in development since Tropical Freeze was finished. It's definitely a Switch game. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. 
yeah, I'm kind of like I, I kind of like to see a proper interview with like Kensuke Tanabe about how he came to be so like closely linked with he he is generally their liaison with a lot of their Western studios. Hmm. Like so so Tanabe's earliest credits are like he was one of the key designers on uh, Doki Doki Panic, aka Mario USA. Uh, A.K.A. R. Mario 2. Uh, but then he, he does, like, a lot of scenario writer credits for, like, early Zelda games. Uh, he did, like, level design for Kirby Stream Course. Uh, and, like, some of the early Kirby games, Dreamland 2, Block Ball. Uh, he gets a special thanks in DKC2, which I think is the first time he's... Sp- he gets a special thanks in a game from a Western developer. Uh, I believe Pilot Wing 64 might have also been Western developed. I don't recall. Uh, Nintendo Paradigm Simulation uh, and a company called Paradigm Simulation, which I've never even heard of, uh, was an American video game development company. What, what the hell did these guys make? Pilot Wing 64, Arrow Fighters, Assault. F1 Grand Prix Pre 1 and 2, Beetle Adventure Racing, that was a good one. Hmm. Uh, Duck Dodgers starring Daffy Duck for some reason. And ultimately, Jesus, it's a weird... Okay, yeah, I actually have played some of the things these guys have made. It's very strange. They did the Spy Hunter PS2 reboot. Uh, yeah, they did a lot of, a lot of racing games. But they they died in the late two uh, thousands. But yeah, uh, he probably interfaced with Paradigm Entertainment in some fashion. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> special thanks on Smash Bros. Assistant manager on Kirby sixty four. Special thanks on Pikmin. And then suddenly he's co producer on Metroid Prime one, and then produces every subsequent Metroid Prime game. Two hunters, uh, corruption, uh, but like he ends up being the producer on a lot of like Western focus stuff, uh, Excitebots, uh, DKC Returns, Dylan's Rolling Western, Paper Mario Sticker Star, uh, some some very strange things. He's a supervisor on the most recent Mario and Luigi. He was the producer on Chibi Robo Ziplash. Hmm. Uh, he was the producer on. Uh, I believe, what is that company's name now? Is it Sto NST? Yeah, uh, Nintendo Software Technology. That's one of their Western arms. He was the producer on the most recent uh, Mini Mario and Friends uh, Amiibo Challenge, which I believe spins off, uh, spun off from the Mario vs. Donkey Kong franchise. Uh, and then we, uh, he was producer on Federation Force, Paper Mario Color Splash, and now he is the only known member of the Metroid Prime 4 team. So I guess we will find out more about that next year, won't we? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That'll be fun to see in glorious high definitions. Are you running around in a circle? Yeah, kind of. Um, Mentally dead? Uh, yeah. I'll well, find a save point. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the the joy of having an emulator. You can Pretty save wherever you want. What's this about states and saving? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I uh, apologize for rambling. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's our calling card. It's all I'm good at. You should be happy I didn't have time to talk about Danger Grandpa. <laughs> At least we didn't have to talk about other M very much. Well, you're the one that just brought it up. Nice job, nerd. Yeah, and I could talk about it any more than that, though. Shh. So I think we're gonna stop.
start wrapping this one up. Uh, obviously, did not get very far, but as you can imagine, this is a relatively long game. And yeah, I feel like Metroid Prime generally the, the those games hold the title for longest Metroid games. Yeah, for sure. Although Samus Returns is a pretty long game by 2D Metroid standards. Yeah, just fine. Yeah, no. That way. It doesn't. It doesn't feel over long. It's just. It is pretty long. Yeah. Um, so, possibly by the time this goes up, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but I think next we're going to be doing Cuphead, and yeah. also um, we'll probably we'll be doing this first. But uh, Hat in Time just came out, so yeah, need to check yeah. that out. Mixed feelings. We'll see how that goes. Mixed feelings. There's a certain member of the voice uh, cast I'm not yeah, happy about. Yeah. Oh. We'll see how that goes, but yeah, so. so uh, see you next mission. It's yeah. actually appropriate this time. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you next mission, and uh, yeah, play some Metroid. Metroid is awesome, and oh, one thing I did want to mention about this, since I don't think it, there's a lot of it in this video, but uh there is platforming in the Metroid Prime series, not as prominent as the 2D games, obviously, but uh, it, it is there. And platforming was a means cool. of exploration in Metroid, and so like the fact that it is decreased in emphasis is not a change to the fundamentals of the series. It's just that right. you explore differently in a 3D environment. But it is there, and there are platforming puzzles, so... One day we'll reach them, maybe. That definitely differentiates it some more from being just a first-person shooter. Yeah. So, that's all. Anyway, we will see you next time. And, see you uh, next mission. Yeah. And like I said, if I can f get my save from the GameCube working with this, we will show you later parts of the game. And that's that. Peace out, Earth. I've got a new...